Live from Case at 12. The six o'clock news starts right now. We finally made it past the freezing mark today. That gave the roads a better chance to clear, but the winter weather is not over. Another system expected to bring something we do not want or need more ice and snow. Here's meteorologist Adam Kasky. Yeah, Steve, you touched on a few topics there. First of all, above freezing. Finally, we went 106 hours straight at or below freezing. We missed the record for consecutive hours at or below freezing by two hours. Two hours is what, how we miss it. All right, let's talk about what's coming our way. Take a look at the satellite and radar and notice that we do have some clearing out west. That's where temperatures have been a little bit warmer but we still have the cloud cover locally. Doesn't matter. We're all going to see that cloud cover filling in tonight and another burst of upper level energy is going to help generate a wintry mix tonight, leading to some wet snow as we get into tomorrow. It's going to start out west again later this evening and tonight as rain around Del Rio. But as it spreads eastward, it's going to change to a wintry mix of sleet and freezing rain after midnight here in San Antonio. Then we go through the morning hours and we see the transition to rain and snow. That's by about sunrise tomorrow and mostly snow into tomorrow afternoon. It's going to be a, a fairly narrow band across South Texas here, but there is the potential of some moderate to heavy accumulations, especially west of town where we'll see some of the higher amounts. We're going to get into those accumulations, break it down for you across South Texas, how much and where and show you the timeline again coming right up. Thank you, Adam. In days past, we were worried about power. Now we're worried about our water. What is happening to San Antonio's water supply? It's a question we're trying to get the answer to. San Antonio Water System today issuing a boil water notice for its customers. That comes as more and more of those customers are dealing with low pressure or they have no water at all. The water utility set to give us an update on how they're dealing with these problems. We have been watching and waiting for that meeting to start. It was supposed to start at 430. We're getting word that it's finally underway. Yeah, it was held up apparently by a special meeting of the city council. They're also trying to get to the bottom of what is happening with the power problem that millions of Texans are going through and have been going through for months. SAW's president and CEO Robert Puente is in that meeting updating city council members on the problem the utility is dealing with. He is also live during the SAW's meeting, but here's some of what he told council members earlier. Our stations require power to pump and to fill the tanks, and it is critical to the building of, pro of, of pressure, proper pressure, to have these tanks full so that when the demand comes, we can push that water out to them. But that is the problem, is that the, the pumps uh, that push the water out into the community sometimes uh, are lacking of, of power. All right, we are monitoring that SAWS meeting right now. I think we're going to try and take it live and see if we can catch a little bit of what they've been talking about. Again, it was supposed to start at 430. It started actually a little bit closer to 545. Let's listen in. Thank you, Steve. I think there are also um, some challenges in being able to see the chats that are popping up. Please make sure you send them to all panelists or to everyone uh, to make sure that we can all see them, okay? And um, I think uh, one thing that we have had come up from, uh, I'm sorry, I'm multitasking here, I'm not, not, okay, so here's one uh, that's coming from Emily Eaton from the Express News. SAWS officials have emphasized that this is a precautionary boil water notice and that water pressure is between 20 and 30 PSI. However, Mr. Puente just said now that this advisory is prompted by state guidelines. Does water pressure drop below PSI? And if so, then wouldn't it be more accurate to describe it as a mandatory boil water notice? I'll answer that question. Um, uh, some parts of San Antonio have dropped below 20 PSI and we have recovered service to where uh, the pressure might be at 30 PSI, for example, now. Some parts of San Antonio, although that is a very small amount, um, never have lost pressure. We've been able to maintain pressure throughout the event. Because we have areas that have been um, running typically in very low pressure, 30 PSI below, or because we have a lot of areas that have been even at 20 PSI or below, 
the regulatory mandatory minimum, um, we are issuing this across the city. Because it's a dynamic situation, while you may have 50 PSI now and be in great shape tomorrow, because of leaks in your area, you may be below 20 PSI. So instead of trying to issue a map every hour on who's got pressure and who doesn't and who should boil and who should not, we've just out of an abundance of caution told everyone that they should boil because we recognize um, this, is a, this is a dynamic and changing situation and we don't want to confuse the public with a boil or don't boil order. It's a citywide boil order out of an abundance of caution, and we're especially recommending those folks, folks that have seen low water pressure. All right, Saul's there boil. detailing the reason for the boil water okay, notice that is uh, now in place. That yeah, that's Stephen Klaus, so who is the chief operating very officer very of the San Antonio Water System. This is Ann Hayden, who's uh, one of the with the communications department. They are taking questions from local reporters about what is happening with the San Antonio Water System. We have somebody monitoring uh, that meeting right now, and hopefully. When we get a better idea of just how long this is going to last or why this is actually happening, they're saying right now it's power outages and leaks. We'll see if that's continued to be what they say. Yeah, if we get any big answers, we promise we're going to give them right to you. So let's turn now from the water to the other big situation we are dealing with. Those power outages continuing to cover San Antonio as the state's power grid continues to struggle to get more generating power and get back online. And the head of CPS Energy doesn't see things changing much until this weekend. She made that estimation during a special city council meeting today. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger with those details. Well, the good news is CPS Energy CEO Paula Gold Williams says the utility is no longer relying on that automated system that irritated so many people in our city with sending them just brief spurts of power for maybe a few minutes. Instead, the utility is switched to trying to manually rotate the blackouts now with a, a goal of a three to five hour window rather than just a couple minutes at a time. Now, the problems with the Texas grid boil down basically to not having enough generation facilities online to power the demand and cold weather makes both of those issues worse making people need more power to heat themselves up and their homes and knocking generation facilities offline in the weather now gold williams says right now it looks like it might be saturday before we can quote get some really good relief it needs to have a warming effect where we're not always going down in below freezing to, to almost zero levels and we need to have the temperatures go up and we need them to stay there and go mild. Um, and we need it across the state. Now, even once that happens, you might not get your power back immediately. Gold Williams says they've had more fuses blown during the outage management process, which means they will have to take time to fix those as well. Now, during all of these outage managements, we've seen that roughly about a third of the system has not gone down because they're on what are called critical circuits. That means they're on the same circuit as critical infrastructure like hospitals. Gold Williams seemed to indicate that would continue to be the case. Live in San Antonio, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. Much of the blame for the prolonged power outages has been placed on ERCOT, which operates Texas electric grid. But today, top officials from the agency said the decision to reduce supply prevented a catastrophic collapse of the entire system. Dylan Collier with more on that mounting criticism. Dylan. And Steve, once we cut through the industry jargon, we were able to confirm that ERCOT's president and CEO Bill Magnus does not know when the state's power situation will return to normal. He defended ERCOT's decision early Monday to begin shedding power, claiming if they had not, Texas could have slipped into an indefinite blackout. With the state's power problems surging toward a fourth day, ERCOT head Bill Magnus was reluctant to speak about his immediate future with the agency. The assessment of how we did, I think, is something that can be done after uh, we get the power back on. Magnus, seated next to an ERCOT senior director during a midday call, defended the agency's move to shed power early Monday, claiming it had to get supply more in line with demand, while also conceding there have been horrible consequences to millions of Texans being without power, some since Sunday. The fundamental decision that was made in the middle of the night, 1 a.m. on Monday, to have the outages imposed uh, 
was a wise decision by the operators that we have here. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg among the public officials going after ERCOT, writing on Twitter that it's, quote, systems threw millions to the cold when we needed them most. The Texas legislature could discuss the widespread outages and ERCOT's role in them as early as next week. Most of the state will be below freezing tomorrow morning. Texas Governor Greg Abbott this afternoon confirming some natural gas, one of the state's hardest hit sources of energy, was still being shipped out of state, forcing him to issue an order requiring those producers that have been shipping to locations outside of Texas to instead sell that natural gas to Texas power generators. That order lasts through Sunday. As generation becomes available, we're utilizing it to the, to the maximum amount possible. ERCOT's board of directors today called for an urgent meeting to look into what went wrong. That meeting scheduled for one week from today. It's worth noting that many of those board members do not live in the state of Texas. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Something else people are learning about ERCOT this week. New at 6 has people in the dark and cold become increasingly angry and worried. Some energy experts are saying, I told you so. Courtney Friedman with a breakdown from an expert with the University of Houston who's been talking about an imminent ERCOT failure for years now. Gonzalo Rodriguez without power for days says he's barely surviving. And I don't think it's fair that I pay my, my electric bill on time and I'm sure there's there's more people like me that are, I'm handicapped, I, I can't walk. He's not just cold, he's worried and angry, and he's definitely not the only one. Monday, Governor Greg Abbott placed blame on ERCOT, the agency that controls 85% of the state's energy, saying, quote, this is unacceptable. Reviewing the preparations and decisions by ERCOT is an emergency item so we can get a full picture of what caused this problem and find long-term solutions. University of Houston Energy Fellow and highly regarded expert Ed Hers says he knows what caused the problem. The ERCOT market design is fatally flawed. Uh, it was never a matter of if it would fail, the only question was when. He predicted way back in 2013, the energy grid in Texas would fail if it wasn't redesigned. Her says ERCOT manages other companies that actually generate the power, but has no way to penalize or control them. He says those companies typically focus on summer months, not the winter. They leave them turned off. They're not uh, winterized. There's no antifreeze. There's, they're not oiled. They're not staffed. They're not ready to respond in a short-term emergency like this. In a press release today, ERCOT's management said, we know millions of people are suffering. We have no other priority than getting them electricity. The one thing is clear, the ice will eventually thaw, but frustration will not. So Texas has no choice but to make future preparation a serious priority. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam this evening, 37 degrees out there, feeling much warmer than it has been, but we are bracing for another round of ice and snow. Adam Kasky has your forecast coming up. So I was happy we were able to get out today, get on the roads, feel somewhat safe. 40s. Mm -hmm. It was nice to hear it, the melting. Yes. We don't hear that often. Yeah, the, the dripping was that nice. wasn't pipes, right? Exactly. Yes. The, yeah. the actual melting of uh, the ice that we had last night and early this morning. That was nice to have. We needed that desperately. And more melting, of course, is in the future. But uh, between now and then, here we go again. I think that's just the best way to put it. Wintry mix developing later tonight. More travel troubles across all of South Texas. It's going to start as a mix of wintry precipita precipitation, then transition into mostly snow as we get into tomorrow. Let's talk about it here. Start with our overall weather pattern. You look across the state and now into Louisiana and Arkansas. That's what we had last night. It's now moving out of here. The energy causing it has shifted the problems eastward. However, we have another burst of energy in our upper level flow, basically moving through El Paso right now, an elongated area of energy that's going to cause a narrow band of precipitation to form tonight through tomorrow, basically just across South Texas. This isn't going to be a widespread event. It's just across our area. So uh, considering the big state as a whole, this is very localized to South Texas. Let's talk about it here. This, I think, is the best computer model to illustrate what's going to happen when and where. So identify your location here. 
on the map. San Antonio, of course, right here in the middle, starting it at 7 p.m. And we're going to pause it here at midnight when the precipitation, mainly rain, starts to move through Del Rio right along the Highway 90 corridor toward Uvalde. After midnight is when we're expecting a light wintry mix of sleet and freezing rain in San Antonio. By sunrise, here we go, 6 a.m. pausing here. By sunrise, that transition to just rain and snow. So a sloppy, slushy, wet mix is what I'm anticipating come sunrise and especially thereafter. 9 a.m., noon particularly, we start to see a transition to mostly just wet snowflakes. And then by sunset tomorrow, this all comes to an end. Of course, accumulations are going to be heavily dependent on where the heaviest little bursts set up and how much snow compared to mix that you get. So that's, of course, a critical thing in terms of accumulations. And there will be some locations that get, I think, some decent amounts of snow here. The kids are going to enjoy it. I'll tell you that west of San Antonio in particular. Back to the timeline, cloudy at 10 p.m. in San Antonio by 3 a.m. a wintry mix, 8 a.m. sleet and snow. By noon, it looks like we're all snow and fairly widespread at that point. So how much could fall? Rule of thumb here, the farther west you are of San Antonio, basically right along Highway 90, the more snow you're likely to get. It's going to be a really, really big difference in terms of snowfall accumulations, unlike our last event on Sunday night. This is really going to be the haves and the have nots, where eastern San Antonio, San Antonio, eastern side of Bear County, traced to an inch. But the west side of town, SeaWorld, Alamo Ranch, and even on into Castroville and western Bear County as well, one to three inches. So I think across Bear County, for the most part, we'll see a few inches, I think is the best way to put it, but there's going to be a big difference even across our area. Del Rio, Brackettville, Lakey, Rock Springs, three to six inches of snow likely from this system come tomorrow afternoon and evening when it's all wrapped up. Still below freezing for a good chunk of the state, especially North Texas and parts of Central Texas around here. We're 36 now in San Antonio, but we'll be dropping down into the upper 20s across South Texas tonight, making it into the mid 30s tomorrow afternoon. A bit breezy as well with that north wind at 10 to 20 miles per hour. By Friday, it's back to sunshine. We will freeze in the morning at 25 but we'll be well into the 40s and sunny, and that sunshine goes a long way with melting on Friday and then this weekend back up around 60. It is unreal we could see snow twice in one week. Which is wrap your mind around. rare seeing it in one year. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. All right, the Spurs, they're young guns, they're making waves including in the music industry? Yeah, you or know. At least with one music icon. And with all the serious things going on, we're taking a fun angle today. We're talking Mariah Carey and Keldon Johnson. KJ is a huge fan of Mariah Carey. This is some pretty funny stuff from Valentine's Day. And Antonian Girls basketball team got a huge boost this season with the addition of Carly Winslow coming up. Says Keldon Johnson written all over it. Specifically, Oladipo. Spurs Keldon Johnson has caught the attention of Mariah Carey in Big Board Sports. The NBA's COVID-19 protocols have resulted in multiple games being postponed. 30 games so far per NBA.com, and four of those games are now Spurs games. Our contest yesterday at Detroit was postponed, as was tonight's game in Cleveland, followed by their games at the Knicks and Pacers. And it's too bad because the Spurs have won two straight and seven of ten, and now they'll have at least nine days off in between games. Their next possible contest is Wednesday the 24th at the Thunder, the final game of the rodeo road trip. Who got something I gon' lean on when times get rough? Who gon' talk to me till the sun goes up? <laughs> ah, I know the whole song! We belong together. 
Oh my goodness. Kelvin Johnson is a natural when it comes to finishing a Mariah Carey song. On Valentine's Day, the Spurs arranged a finished the lyric segment that aired during their game of Charlotte. The song was We Belong Together by Mariah Carey and Keldon nailed it. The Spurs posted it on Twitter and Mariah gave it a retweet and said, Aw, baby, baby, we belong together. Keldon is a huge fan of her music. So what was it like to see her response to his singing? It was cool, you know what I'm saying? It was like, dang. Like, when, when, they, when they sent it to me, I was like, yo, like, that's crazy. Because, like, I mean, she, she's, like, my favorite artist. It's already good enough that she, she posted it and that she's seen it. While Keldon didn't miss a beat, DeMar DeRozan did, and he mumbled the words. Mariah on another retweet said, come on, DeMar, be more like Keldon. Due to inclement weather, the UIW football team will not open their spring schedule Saturday at home versus Sam Houston. The game was scheduled for April 17th with kickoff time to be announced at a later date. The Cardinals are now scheduled to open their spring football season Saturday, February 27th at McNeese, who has won an O this season under head coach Frank Wilson. Earlier this month, the Sam Houston Hurricanes had two young men signed to play football at the next level. Defensive end Darius Govan is going to Blend College, and DB Faison Reese will take his skills to Highland Community College. Head football coach Quincy Stewart says this is huge for the Hurricanes. It's huge. It's life changing for a lot of them uh, that they get this opportunity uh, and, it, and it starts a generation where, uh, you know, they can get higher education, not only higher education for some of it, it, it leads to, to promising careers. So it's, it's huge. Yes, it is. In high school hoops, the Antonian girls basketball team got a huge boost this season when standout player Carly Wenzel transferred from O'Connor to join the Apaches. She's a guard forward and one of the top players in the country. This season, she averaged 18.4 points and 9.7 rebounds per game. We recently caught up with Antonio and asked the junior why she transferred to Antonian. When I decided to uh, transfer out of O'Connor, um, it was really somewhere where our culture would already be set where it would have to be um, kind of created. So come in here, uh, they have a great culture. Um, coach really works hard to uh, get us better and get us ready to beat teams. Antonian finished the regular season 20 and three and is ranked second in the state in 6A private schools by the Texas Association of Basketball Coaches. And next up for the Apaches, the playoffs. Can we go back to Keldon and I Mariah? knew it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because, okay, so Mariah's got a big hit. Yep. Keldon is under COVID protocol, right? Yep. How about a duet? <laughs> All I want for quarantine is you. <laughs> I'm for it. Maybe not. Maybe not. No, I agree. Yes, Thumbs up. Womp yeah. Womp from Kasky. It'd be Our a KSAC. great holiday hit. <laughs> KSAC Q&A is up next. <laughs> It is time for our KSAT Q&A, where we take some of your questions, our questions, to people who can hopefully give us factual answers. And boy, do we have a lot of questions today. Yesterday and the day before, it was about our power supply. Today, it's about our water supply. And we are joined by State Representative Diego Bernal right now. Uh, Diego, I appreciate you joining us. Sure. Am, am I overstating it by saying it looks like our power system and our water systems are failing us right now? I think the power system is failing you, absolutely. And I think the water system is so closely associated with the power system that it's not able to function properly the way that we want it to. I, I hope we can get through that over the next day or so. But the power system is absolutely failing you. It's failing me. It's failing all of all of Texas. And we have... Um, there's a lot that we can do to get out of it, but it's going to take some time. There are a lot of players in this. We've got CPS Energy, San Antonio Water System, SAWS, ERCOT, a name that a lot of Texans are hearing and learning about for the first time this week. So where do you think the responsibility lies here and where's the breakdown? The, the primary responsibility, honestly, is at ERCOT. Uh, ERCOT is responsible for the Texas grid, and it's important that you know that Texas stands on its own. The rest of the country is joined together in two separate massive grids, and Texas is by itself because we want to be Texas. ERCOT had the opportunity to weatherize our plants and our infrastructure so we could handle something like this. They decided not to. They didn't want to spend the money. It's like shopping for a car and deciding not to get the heated seats or the, the four-wheel drive option. They decided not to do it. And then we got very, very cold across the state and all of these plants shut down and they couldn't get 
electricity to the rest of us. Um, now, of course, CPS has a role to play, but it's minor relative to, to ERCOT. And so uh, we have a lot to do with ERCOT. We have a lot of, uh, I mean, honestly, heads need to roll because they made bad decisions and people are hurting. People are dying now because of it. But I would, I, if I had to pick one primary culprit, it would be ERCOT. But ERCOT doesn't necessarily let SAWS and CPS Energy off the hook by just blaming them, correct? No, they don't. I think that that everyone could have been more prepared, both in terms of the way that they're managing the load, but also in the way that they're helping people cope with the inevitable blackout, right? If we're going to lose power, then let's not scramble after people have been freezing in their homes for 24 hours. Let's get ahead of it. And we just we just did it. So, um, no, they're not off the hook at, at all. But and, and I think more than anything, and we talked about this at the break, people want to know what's going on. So even if you have bad news, give them news. I, I feel like everyone is hiding and pointing the finger, but no one's talking to people. And people just want to know what's going on, what to expect, how to plan. Uh, and that's really why I'm here is because I'm just as frustrated as everybody else. Yeah, and that's adding and compounding to that frustration, the fact that people aren't sure what we should actually be expecting over right. the coming days. Is our water system, is our power system going to be uh, reliable? So uh, what do you make of what can be done right now. We know that there are big questions to be addressed. And like you said, people need to be held accountable for what's played out. What right. should be happening at this moment to get us through this? That's a great question. I, I, I am less concerned with accountability than I am with making sure people survive the next few days, right? So we'll get to accountability when everyone's all right. Um, I think that the one thing that we can do, that all of us can do, you, me, businesses, residents, to get through this, to shorten the amount of time that it's going to take to get out of it, is to conserve energy. Every watt that you don't use goes back into the grid and builds enough capacity to add one more house, one more block, one more city back on the grid. So what we need to do is conserve, right? Turn off lights, unplug things, unplug your PlayStation, unplug your Alexa, um, turn your thermostat down. If we all do that, and this is businesses too, I'm tired of seeing businesses with their front windows lit up, with the neon signs lit up, with the, the top floor lit up, and no one's in there. We all need to stop using energy so that we can send that energy that's not being used to people so they can get their heat back on and get their lives going again. The more that we do that collectively, the shorter this will be. And once we get back up and running, then we turn to accountability and start finger wagging. But I just want people to be okay and to survive. Absolutely. And I, I want to give it, we got a bit of breaking news. That's why I was taking notes while Myra was asking you that last question. Methodist Stone Oak Hospital, low water pressure on their fourth and fifth floors. They are transport, transporting patients out of that hospital right now to other hospitals. And, and Diego, I, I don't want to put you on the spot. So if you don't want to answer this question, go ahead. But you're a former city councilman. You've been working with the state. How much did you know when you were on the city council about the inner workings of CPS Energy and the San Antonio water system? Even though there are things that we own, I mean, when you hear things like critical circuits weren't going to some of the SAWS water plants and they were shut down as part of the power saving. I mean, sure. do we need to know more about these certain entities that are so important to our community? It's, it's a great question. I don't mind answering it. Uh, I wasn't an expert. I didn't know as much as I should. I think the problem is you've got a council who don't know much. Um, you've got you've got the utilities that present to council, and what you really need, I think, is an objective third party to call balls and strikes of what's being said is true or not true. All we had to go on was what they said to us, um, and there's really no reason not to believe them. But at the same time, it doesn't allow you to ask the tough questions to make sure that you're more prepared. Um, I do think that something like this is hard to predict, but also without getting too political, but as the climate has been changing, as, as weather has gotten more unpredictable, you then can predict that we would have something like this happen. And we just weren't ready. So it's a fair question. Uh, I think we need an objective third party to inform policymakers on calling balls and strikes and what you've been told by the state in ERCOT, by CPS, by SAWS and the rest. Uh, before we go here, I want to ask you about something that you've been tweeting a lot about over the last couple of days, something that's just adding to the frustration. And frankly, it's it's maddening to see price gouging. 
when right. hotels or other businesses perhaps are jacking up prices because they know people need a place to stay. What do those businesses need to know about that practice and what can people do to report it? Right, so price gouging um, for a lot of materials already is illegal in an emergency situation. But after what we saw in Hurricane Harvey, which was really hard to see, uh, my staff and I added uh, lodging to that definition so that hotels, Airbnbs and the like couldn't price gouge or jack up prices during an emergency situation, which is what this is. If people see it, if they see insane pricing, unfair pricing, pe people taking advantage of folks desperate moments um, you should let your local DA know and also let um, the current attorney general know. And if you want, you can always send them to our office. We're happy to collect them and send them over, which we've been doing already. Representative Diego Bernal, always appreciate your time and your insight. Uh, I, I did say that this is really an emergency that's affecting every part of town, no matter where you live, no matter how you live who you live with, it's affecting people. I know it's affected you. you. You joked around with me that you have three households under one roof right now. Yeah, so my best to your family and thank you for taking the time with us. Thank you guys. Stay safe, we'll be right back. Well, that didn't take long. Within days of the announcement that Harry and Meghan are expecting their second child, the Meghan Markle wax figure at Madame Tussauds has a baby bump. The Wax Museum Sydney location posted this photo of a Markle figure on social media. In addition to the bump, Meghan's wax doppelganger went to the Sydney Zoo for a maternity photo shoot. Okay, that explains the kangaroo. Meghan, the <laughs> Duchess of Sussex, and her husband, Prince Harry, announced Sunday they're expecting their second child. In its post, Madame Tussauds congratulated the couple and the soon-to-be big brother, Archie. Taking an oh-so-short break from all of this weather that we are dealing yeah. with. Look outside right now, 36 degrees. It hasn't been too bad out there today. We know more is coming. How about the temperatures, though, Adam? Are we going to get as bitterly cold no. as we have been? Okay. No, no, no. But we will face a freeze basically the next three nights. So that's something to plan for. And to put the temperatures in perspective, we had 106 hours straight of temperatures at or below freezing, which was two hours shy of the record when we had 108 hours back in the 1950s. Today we started at 24 and I never thought I'd say we got to a refreshing 45, but we did. It felt, felt, good. felt good out there today at 45 degrees for the high temperature. Hondo made it up to 50. Some of these readings are erroneous, of course, for the highs. Communication issues, of course, with uh, some of the reporting sites out there. So that's why you saw 32 for a high for some of them. Of course, that's an error, but we have more on the way. We're not done yet. Another round. Our last hurrah, the caboose of wintry weather for this week is moving through. We're going to talk more about it coming up. If you're broke, you need to earn some cabbage. If you're gullible, you may have fallen off the cabbage truck. If you do something foolish, you might be called a cabbage head. And if you want a healthy snack of leafy greens, you might enjoy eating some actual cabbage. What better way to celebrate National Cabbage Day? Yeah, according to the National Day calendar, cabbage first brought to the U.S. by French explorer Jacques Cartier. Now we know. Uh-huh. <laughs> cabbage is a diverse vegetable that's the main ingredient in dishes like kimchi, coleslaw, and many <laughs> salads. Look, Brussels I, sprouts, cauliflower, and broccoli, all different forms of cabbage. They inspired Cabbage Patch Kids. And this is what you're watching. Visitors to Babyland General Hospital in Cleveland, Georgia, can watch the live birth of one of the famous Cabbage Patch dolls. What? I'm so glad that on National Cabbage Day, we made sure to get Cabbage Patch dolls in there. Mine I was can't. Janice. I you had one. one. I sure did, yeah. Hmm. Okay. You familiar with the Cabbage Patch? That's the look I thing? get from you, from you too? No, I, I'm impressed Cab by your Cabbage Patch ancestry. Hey, you know what? <laughs> Janice was a good friend to me back in the day. I can tell. I, I I've, I've overstepped my bounds. Luckily, I'm I've sorry, made two, I, I'm sorry. two very good friends here as well. Thanks for your support. We're always here for you, Myra. Yeah, I'm I chose to sit this one out early. Yeah. <laughs> your, your facial expressions did enough. We're here Amen. for you. Steve, Adam, and somewhere Janice. <laughs> <laughs> They're for you. <laughs> 
Well, I'm glad we could have a lighter moment here. Yes. Okay, right. we need that. We really do need that. Absolutely do. And uh, tonight it's going to be changing again. We get another round of wintry precipitation. It's going to affect conditions late tonight, but especially throughout all of your Thursday. Let's start with a look at road temperatures out there. These are estimates, but they seem to be uh, pretty accurate and do a good job with the, the sunshine even through the clouds today really helped warm up those road temperatures. So we've got estimates of road temperatures in the low to mid 40s. Basically, that's what we end. That's what we have out there right now. So it melted all that ice and mainly there's just some water left over. However, I do want to point out that these road temperatures will be dropping quickly again tonight, just as they did the past couple of nights. They may rise during the day with our South Texas sun, even through the clouds, but at night they fall off. So here's our weather story. This is what we need to plan for. Wintry mix developing overnight tonight, probably after midnight for San Antonio, becoming mostly snow into tomorrow. There will be some rain mixed in, so it's going to be a sloppy, wet, slushy snow, which kids is the best for making snowballs and snowmen, not like the powdery stuff we had Sunday night. Tomorrow, snowy and slushy roads. Travel is going to be an issue again across South Texas starting later tonight and lasting all day tomorrow. Friday morning, we'll have another freeze, but by Friday afternoon, bright sunshine and a good melt on the way. So here's our system that hit us yesterday last night and early this morning sorry my days are just blending together this week i almost had to ask siri what day is it today right because they're just blending together so this was our last system let's just call it that that hit us last night early this morning now it's wreaking havoc far to the east of us mississippi valley area moving into tennessee our next system is moving into west texas right now with embedded within this big trough in the upper levels this big dip in the flow there's a real potent punch of energy in this flow and it's already developing this radar activity you see in northern Mexico. It's going to continue to head our way and gradually develop rainfall tonight along the Rio Grande. So we're talking by 10 11 o'clock. We'll probably have some rain showers out near Del Rio, maybe down to K Motto, possibly stretching eastward along Highway 90. But after midnight here in San Antonio, we're expecting a light wintry mix, some freezing rain and sleet to develop. Then we get to sunrise tomorrow and a transition to rain snow into tomorrow afternoon, becoming mostly wet snow. I know it's a lot. It's confusing. Basically expect a slushy, messy mix tonight through sunset tomorrow and travel to be disrupted. Accumulations, though, they're very important. And in this situation, it's it's the type of situation where it's going to be a big difference between the halves and have nots. And we really think the haves in terms of the snow by tomorrow evening, this time tomorrow, Del Rio, Brackettville, maybe even Uvalde, Lakey and Rock Springs could be talking three to six inches of fresh snow on the ground. You get a little closer to San Antonio, about one to three. And within Bear County here, we're going to, I think, have a big wide range of measurements, a trace to e trace to an inch east of town, one to three inches possible farther to the west of Bear County on the western side of Bear County. Temperature wise 28 tonight, 35 by tomorrow afternoon. And yes, you can accumulate snow on the ground even when the air temperature is above freezing. Sunny in 40s on Friday this weekend back to 60. At least 28 is not nine. It's not. It's not nine. It's not. That it, was just seemed odd. Yeah, it was weird. <laughs> in case you missed it coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Well, as power outages continue to plague San Antonio, things are changing today. Water is becoming as big of an issue, if not more, at this point. SAWS has now issued a boil water notice for its users. SAWS CEO Robert Puente calls this a precautionary measure as water pressure dips in the SAWS system. When that happens, TCEQ mandates a boil notice like this one. Now, SAWS officials say pumping stations are also getting intermittent power right now, like the rest of us. And there are a lot of broken pipes in people's homes 
that are leaking water. That water has to go somewhere, which also means lower water pressure in the pipes. And as many residents remain without power, multiple warming centers have been set up across our area. If you're stuck in the cold, if you're able to safely travel, we made a complete list of warming center locations both in San Antonio and our surrounding areas. If you know somebody who's in this situation, they can't get online, calling 311 will also get you this information. COVID-19 protocols will be in place at these locations. We'd also encourage you to call ahead to check availability. HEB altering hours, setting limits on items at locations in San Antonio. HEB says the majority of its locations open to 10 this morning. They will close at 7 tonight. Other locations in the area surrounding San Antonio have varying hours. HEB has also set some purchase limits on some items. And if you use curbside or home delivery, the grocer says there will likely be limited time slots over the next several days. We have a full list of the limits and the store schedules right now on our website at ksat.com. All right, so temperatures right now in the 30s, they'll be dropping below freezing into the upper 20s later on tonight. So another freeze tonight along with that precipitation, a wintry mix developing tonight, and we will have a chance to get barely into the mid 30s by tomorrow afternoon, Friday back in the 40s. Thanks, Adam, and thanks for watching. Stay safe. See you.